Okay, guys, thanks again for coming this afternoon. <laughs> We're running, yeah. Uh, thanks again for coming this afternoon. Some new faces, which is always lovely to see. Uh, my name is Rob. Uh, this is the Dignity Alliance. And then to further the purpose and interest of the Dignity Alliance is about we're opposed to all forms of slavery, slave trading, and similar practices of uh, involuntary servitude. And uh, we try to bring in speakers who are offering solutions and uh, uh, ideas you can take forward to, to defend your, your own freedom and your own your, against all these these uh, obnoxious uh, activities. So uh, graciously, Michael Bernissi has uh, agreed to, to spend a few hours with us to explain the, the incredible work he has been doing. Uh, and luckily he's picked up the first dry day we've had in Ashton this year. This, this is the summer by the <laughs> Right, so uh, yeah, so with no further ado then I'll pass over to, to Michael and uh, be prepared to take it. I'm going to call this talk, for obvious reasons, the Great British Mortgage Swindle. Now I'm sure that some of you are already aware, myself and Michael O'Dara sitting at the back there, have made a film over the past six years called The Great British Mortgage Swindle, about the Great British Mortgage Swindle, and this is based on the upon the experiences, and it chronicles the experiences, of four pioneering lay litigants on the front line trying to expose to the people and the legal professions that the entire mortgage industry is founded upon institutionalized fraud at every single level. So I'm going to begin by just explaining what actually happens when anybody goes into a mortgage broker's and asks for a mortgage. So let's say Fred and his wife, Mabel, they go into a, an office and they say, right, we've got a property that we got our eye on that we want to buy. So obviously we need a mortgage to buy it because we haven't got the cash to pay for it outright ourselves. The bank manager determines through an examination of the projected income of both <coughs> prospective mortgagors whether or not they qualify under the regulations set down by the Council of Mortgage Lenders. Now, those regulations basically say something between three and a half and four times the income that is projected should be the amount of the proposed loan. However, as we've already established, Fred and Mabel do not yet own the property that they want to acquire. So once the mortgage broker has said, right, here is an offer, which offers you a certain amount of money. Let's say that that <coughs> amount is 200,000. And with that 200,000, they would be able to acquire the property. So then they have to, upon the advice of the mortgage broker, and because it is already accepted standard practice that they do so, they employ a member of the legal professions, a convincing solicitor to basically act on their behalf to represent their interests in the proposed mortgage transaction. So, the first thing the solicitor does is say, right, all you need to do is to execute the documents that I'm going to give you. And basically those documents amount to a legal charge against the property that they do not yet own. Okay? Now, to grant a legal charge, there is one prerequisite in law and in equity. That prerequisite is that you own the property. In other words, you have a proprietary interest, or you are the registered proprietor of that property. Otherwise, you have no legal or equitable right to grant any interest of any nature over that property for the simple reason you don't yet own it. So, you're, you go to the convincing solicitor asking for legal advice pertaining to your mortgage and they give you illegal advice by advising you to execute the disposition of an interest over a property you do not own who be which belongs to somebody else which is registered in the name of somebody else. And the whole purpose of you seeking the mortgage advance is to 
get the credit in order to acquire the property that you've already executed an illegal and void charge over. Because everybody does it, because all the conveyancing solicitors have been taught to do this, does that make it okay? Does that make it lawful or equitable? Okay, from the spring of 2009 until August 2009 and beyond in other sets of proceedings, Michael issued a, a, a counterclaim against Bradford and Bingley because they had been unable to provide evidence that A, there was a valid mortgage contract in existence, which is illegal, and B, that there was a valid charge in existence, which is illegal, and C, that the bank had any money to lend him in the first place, and that all the transaction amounted to at best was an electronic transfer of credit. Now, credit is not money. Credit is only acceptable as money if it's transferred from bank to bank under a much smaller interest rate than they ever charge against customers. So, let's just recap here. The contract which doesn't exist has to comply with Section 2 of the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989, which prescribes very clearly that every single mortgage contract must be signed by both the bank and the customer in order for it to be valid. If that isn't the case, the, the contract must be considered as void in law. Okay? In all our experiences, until these arguments that we presented became so prevalent that they could no longer be ignored, we did not witness one single mortgage transaction which had either a valid contract under Section 2 or under Section 1.3 of the same Act, the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989, the deed must be witnessed by an independent, the signature on the deed rather, must be witnessed at the moment of execution, meaning the moment you put the signature upon it, it has to be witnessed by an independent witness who must attest by signature and a declaration of their address or their location or their business, if they're a solicitor, and their profession. And if that declaration attesting it to the mortgage or signature is not done properly or it's done after the date it was signed, it's void under Section 1.3 of the 1989 Act. Now, we have also never seen, until the last couple of years, any deed or, or charge, because they're called both, that complied with Section 1.3. Now, let's just imagine this. So how many people in this room, if they knew in their hearts and through the diligent observation of the facts, how many people in this room believe that if they go into a courtroom and they present the facts to a judge, that the judge will apply the law in accordance with what is presented before him? How many people believe that would happen in a court of law in this country? Right. Um, there's only you who raise your hand, just in case you don't, well, because he couldn't see. <laughs> and um, I empathise with your faith that that would be the case. Because when we began this civil war, which is what it is, when we began, I in my heart had this idea that sooner or later we take it into a certain court and some judge who was there for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons, would do the right thing and say, no, there's no valid deed, there's no valid contract, this man should not be thrown out of his house. Every single time all of those arguments have been presented with all of the case law that supports the points that we're making, every single time the judges have thrown out the arguments as totally without merit, without paying heed to the facts. Now, there are many different reasons why this is or why this could be. However, I'm going to continue chronicling exactly what's happened in the least expansive amount of time possible because there really is a lot to go through. But nevertheless, in broad strokes, when Michael went in and made these arguments, a judge called Inglis in Nottingham, who was acting more like Nero than a judge, 
He decided that the facts didn't matter and ordered the violent eviction of Michael from his home. He ignored all the facts after numerous hearings, after appeals. Michael's case only got stronger, but he was making the same arguments from the beginning. So, at around the same time, he was doing this and coming to the end just before he was violently thrown out of his home. I went into the High Court, phoned on behalf of the trustees of my family's private property trust. Now my dad is the founding trustee, and many years ago he was approached by Bank of Scotland, and they said to him, you've got two million pounds worth of property, you've got no borrowings, we want to help. And he said, I don't need help, why would I need borrowings when I have no debts, and why do I need your help, you're going to have to convince me. It took a number of months to convince him. He's a straight down the line alpha male, 70 year old Jody, who's done it his own way his entire life and he will not bow to authority and he will not be bullied. In fact, he goes for bullies, he always has. So, given that, my dad says, right, look, you're going to have to offer me something much better than what I've got and you're going to have to give me some kind of undertaking that you're not going to pull the rug from under our feet at some point. And they offered a rolling credit facility. That meant that all he had to do was ring up and say how much the property was valued at, they would send their valuer, and if they agreed that it was set at the right level, they would advance whatever the credit was. And they continued to do this as the, the trustees acquired more properties, and they got themselves into a position just before the completely manufactured credit crunch, where they were stretched to the point where they could just about meet all of the costs every month, and the bank were coming after them for more interest. Now in seven years, the trustees paid back to the bank £50,000 in excess of the credit that the bank extended to acquire the properties. <coughs> he paid more than they lent him, if they lent him a penny. So, when the bank came after him for what was entirely compound interest payments, he said, whoa, hang on a minute, you said you weren't going to turn on me. You are effectively stabbing me in the back. I will not stand for that. And I, I'm going to take whatever measures I need to take along with the trustees in order to prevent you basically seizing our assets. So, the trustees appointed me because of a certain knowledge that I had in certain legal areas and because they didn't know a single member of the legal professions apart from one of the trustees who was a convincing solicitor of 35 years who had acted in all the property transactions that the trust was involved in apart from him my dad wouldn't trust any other legal professionals and it had taken a while for me to explain to him exactly why he'd been hoodwinked by the bank who are, let's make no bones about it, they're engaged in the seizure of the property from the people and from anyone who's got property who's not part of the, the vested interests of the Crown Corporation or the Crown House of Rothschild. So, given the fact that he knew that morally, if the bank had lent him any money, and the trustees any money, he paid back in excess of what they lent. So he, we, what we gave them was a list of questions. These are the questions. Can you provide material evidence that there is a valid and enforceable mortgage contract in existence? Can you provide evidence that there is a legally enforceable mortgage deed in existence? Can you provide evidence that demonstrates that the bank had any money to lend the trustees at the time of the alleged loan? What did the bank do when we delivered those questions? Ignored, Ignored them and didn't even respond. They responded by making a statutory demand, demanding approximately <laughs> two and a half million in unenforceable compound interest payments in excess of the loan. So they're basically saying, right, we want more than double the value of the loan for us not to come and seize the properties. That's what they were saying. So we took the bull by the horns. The trustees and myself, acting under power of attorney in the name of the trustees, filed a claim for fraud against the bank and some Law of Property Act receivers who'd been appointed to basically illegally manage the properties 
and run them into the ground, refuse to do any maintenance, drive all of the tenants and businesses who operated in the, pro in the properties, who were always very, very happy with the way my dad had treated them, because he's always fair and he sticks to what he agrees, and he's always there to do maintenance whenever it's needed, or he sends someone round, and he does it straight away. Now, the receivers illegally registered their names as receivers over all of the properties on, in July 2010. So by October 2010, we were in court arguing that there was no valid mortgage, there was no valid contract, and the bank could not provide any evidence that they had lent any money, and in any event, we, my dad and the trustees wanted to settle it in the best, in the most amicable way possible, rather than going into the dispute that we ended up going into, and they, they basically refused to accept the tender of a promissory note made payable to bearer. Now, a promissory note made payable to bearer is no different from every single note of fiat currency that you might have in your pocket. It's not money. It's a promise to pay money. But the only type of credit, or rather the only type of payment that they will accept from any of the people is whatever they deem to be the currency that they want to be paid in. In other words, your sweat equity. And I say that at a moment that I'm absolutely dripping in sweat, so the front row will have to forgive me. You may get sprayed. But, um, it's okay. Nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, when we went into the court, who do you think Bank of Scotland sent up against me? My first time presenting a case in the High Court, do you, who would you imagine they would send up against me? What, 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 what level of barrister? Hi, they sent someone who was, who was, who was named and awarded and described as probably the best barrister of his age group. He went to Trinity College, Cambridge, which is the, the heart of upper class Fabian brainwashing. And he, he had written three books, if my memory serves me correctly, on something called documentary credits. Documentary credits are umpteen various forms of negotiable and non-negotiable instruments that can be deposited in private accounts and the bank, whoever the bank is, would be able to take the credit from all those documents. Now, he'd written three books on this. And I presented all these arguments that I've just presented to you in very simple terms. Over the course of 40 minutes, I referred to many pieces of case law that was binding upon the court. And we had something which we thought there was no way around for the judge. We had a purported contract which the bank said was perfectly legal and enforceable and it was just an unsigned offer of the facility from the bank at the beginning of the facility. Now, an unsigned piece of paper with terms and conditions is unenforceable because it's not binding on the party who makes it. A signature of that party without the party who's on the other side of the mortgage transaction, is still not valid. It needs to be signed by both parties. So we thought, right, well, there's a, there's a blank space where the signature should be. And they're saying this is a valid contract. And I pointed all this out to the judge, who was the chief judge in Newcastle Courts at the time, uh, Judge Walton. And after I presented everything, he gruffly dismissed everything as totally without merit and agreed with the barrister's argument, which was that a promissory note was not a good tender because the bank wanted to be paid in cleared funds. And that was a binding term in the purported contract which was unsigned by the bank. He then argued that it didn't have to be signed by the bank because it's well established that a bank does not need that contract to enforce a mortgage and that there was nothing wrong with any of the nine mortgages which we were disputing. Now, I, try, I stood up at that point and said, the contract isn't, it it's can't be valid, it's not signed. You shut up, you had your turn, sit down. That's what I got. <clears throat> now if that had happened at school, I would have told him to F off, but I held me cool. And I sat down and I, I waited for my opportunity. And I watched the barrister continue the sophistry and to convince the judge that yes, his instincts were right that there is an automatic contract which arises with every mortgage transaction and it doesn't need to be signed by the bank. And when everything was dismissed as totally without merit, the judge awarded for one hearing over £90,000 to the bank in costs. For one barrister and two lawyers 
who had been dealing with the dispute for three months. At this point, we realized that they really were trying to put the fear of God of us. They wanted us to pack in. You know, they want to think, right, you're going to lose everything if you can continue in this fight. But as I said, my dad has never backed down when he's been approached by a bully. Never. And neither have I. So, <coughs> what transpired was, we took issue with the judgment, and we challenged it on all of those grounds, and we found further evidence. We didn't know at the time of the initial hearing that the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act sections 1 and 2 were sustaining all of our points. Then we found umpteen pieces of case law from the Court of Appeal and the High Court, judgments by a judge called Lightman J in a case called Murray v. Guinness, and a case called Lloyd v. Bryant, in which he affirmed the point that if there is no Section 2 compliant contract, the contract is void. And this was, this was also affirmed in a case called United Bank of Kuwait v. Sarheep in 1996. Lord Justice Gibson stated very clearly that subsequent to the enactment of the 1989 Act, the old rule where part performance was considered evidence, sufficient evidence of contract was abolished. That meant they could never make the argument which had been sustained for so many decades in the courts over mortgage issues, which was the bank doesn't need a contract, all that is required is that the, it is the intention of the mortgagor to enter into a mortgage transaction. And they've been getting away with that along with supplying <coughs> printed statements from computers to, to validate, supposedly, the debt or the alleged debt. Right. So we took all of these case laws and we put them in our appeal to the Court of Appeal. And we were more aggressive in our stance than before because it was clear there'd been a miscarriage of justice. And my dad, who is obviously featured in the Great British Mortgage Swindle quite heavily, he admits that he was naive, naive enough to believe that someone was going to say, oh, there's been a mistake. We're going to put it right. So what do you think happened? Three, was it, it was 16 <coughs> weeks after we submitted an appeal which was supposed to be totally without merit, so 16 weeks after its submission to the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Lloyd ruled that the application was entirely without merit and that the argument that Section 2 applied to the purported contract was wrong and that he was going to deny us the opportunity to put the points in a hearing, even though I, well, my oldest friend since I was 10 is a barrister, uh, one of the few that I would trust, I mean, less than a handful. And he told me that never, in all of his experience in the law, three decades now, never has he ever known a legal professional to be denied a root of appeal and a hearing of the issues. And it's happening every single time to all litigants in person, to get us out of courts. So when he did this, you know, we were thinking, right, well, what we've established through Michael's case and through ours was that if you go in and attempt to apply the law as Parliament intended, they will not apply the law if it is an application which is not in the Crown's interests every time. Now, which, let's, let, let's, let's just ponder for a second, which banks currently running institutionalized fraud on these islands are not or could not be classified as a crown interest. Which banks? We Bank. Pardon? We bank. We bank. Let's not talk about We Bank within their system because uh, well, I might answer questions on that later because it's, it's very... Say no. again. Clydesdale, the Australian bank. Uh, no. 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 None. None of them. None of them. None. None of them. Provably. So we go... To, in an attempt to try and stop this, we go to something called the Court Funds Office at the Royal Court of Justice. And we say to them, you have the means under the Court Funds rules, and we quote, quoted which rules, I believe it was number 12 and number 14, you have the means when a, dis, uh, when a debt is disputed and payment of the purported debt has been made in good faith, you have the means to accept whatever instrument was tendered 
as a security, as a valid negotiable security, and hold it until the bank accepts it, or until the other party accepts it. The manager of the core funds office and the government official who was in charge of policy at the, at the core funds office came down and met me and my father and the other trustee in the lobby of their building. They wouldn't let us come up. Do you know that? And they said, we've read all of the documents that you've given us, and the, 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 I know it's got lots of quotes from core funds rules, which we've never heard of. We're just not going to accept it unless you bring us a court order ordering us to accept it, but we can't see that happening, so please don't come back again. And I said, but it says in your rules you can accept promissory notes like this. No, no, I'm sorry, I don't accept that, and you're just going to have to take it up with the court. So we're getting the shutters down at every single gate. It didn't matter where we went, it was the same, no, no, I'm sorry, that is totally without merit, we don't accept what you're putting forward. So, given all of that, considering that the Supreme Court hadn't long been operating, we decided that we would give it a chance. And we appealed, or rather we applied for permission to appeal to the Supreme Court, we sent the entire bundle, and we had even more evidence in support this time that our arguments were correct. It didn't even get past the registrar a woman called Louise de Mambro, who also at the time, and perhaps still now, I haven't checked, but she was registrar of the Supreme Court at the same time she was acting as a senior member of the Queen's Privy Council. Now, when do you know that banks have been nationalised? When do you know? When they're so, Not always when they tell you. You, 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 can't, you, can't, you can't ascertain how they've been nationalised. When a bank is acquired through public money, and there is no sale of the bank, the bank has been nationalised. Okay? So Bank of Scotland, Lloyd's Group, it's all part of the same interest, and it's the Crown's interest. They have at least a 72% stake in that banking group. The House of Rothschild, who pretty much owns, or, or at least controls, absolutely everything in the entire financial system, or almost. <coughs> they have also acquired banks that fell under in the credit crunch, such as Abbey National, Santander, begins, that belongs to them as well. And what they've been doing through Bank of Scotland, and this is critical to understanding how this all came about, what they've been doing is issuing mortgages in the names of what they term high net worth individuals, in other words, people with significant assets in property, and they've been issuing false fraudulent mortgages in their names in order to take everything from them. And they never even receive a, a line of credit. And they're coming after them in the courts as if they did. And I'm helping two women who are currently fighting that at the moment. If that bank was insolvent, according to their former head of risk management, Paul Moore, from 2003 at least, why was it that it took five years for everyone to realise that the entire system had gone tits up. Why was it? I'll tell you. Because they're creating offshore, off balance sheet, completely outside of the jurisdiction of any regulator and any law forum. They are creating shell companies in which to pour all of the money. All of it. They didn't have any toxic loans. As the presentation that Carmel Butler gave to Parliament demonstrated beyond doubt. She was given access to the entire mortgage book of, um, I believe, was it Bradford? And it was Northern Rock. And she proved beyond doubt to Parliament that there was no such thing as toxic debt. The money had been taken. <coughs> no one can trace it, but there's a guy called Gordon Bowden. Who, he's done 20 years worth, I believe, of incredible forensic research proving that all of these scams, all of these institutionalized frauds trace right back to the House of Rothschild. We basically issued a lien valued in excess of 200 million under common law, under private common law against James Crosby. James Crosby and Bank of Scotland then threw the dirtiest set of legal professionals that I've ever witnessed. And their job was to take everything from us and put with the courts into believing that the bank's arguments were correct. When the courts decided that they were going to ignore everything that we were putting forward and the Supreme Court chucked it out twice and shredded the documents that we delivered to them the second time for fear that we were going to send it to them a third time demanding that they take another look. So we issued new proceedings against the bank and the receivers 
on the ground that a fraud upon the court had been perpetrated in that they swore in evidence that every single mortgage was valid. They put their oath on paper and executed it, affirming that they had checked all of the mortgages for their validity, that all of the mortgage deeds complied and they didn't need a contract. Okay? So the fraud was, they lied to the judge and said, yes, we checked, all the mortgages are valid, and all of their arguments are rubbish. So when they got served with the fraud upon the court claim, which does something spectacular that is almost invisible. Every judge up until that point, in every case that we witnessed, had chucked everything out was totally without merit, as I say. Everything. But when you put a fresh claim to impeach a judgment on the ground that a fraud has been perpetrated against the court, he's not able to railroad you or put the shutters down because you're saying, actually, the court is a victim of this. There's a fraud that's been perpetrated against the court, so the court becomes the claimant against the bank. Thank you. If the allegations are supported with evidence. Now, what was the evidence that we had? The evidence was, well, the judge, Judge Walton, whose original decision we were appealing, mistakenly said, or lied, whichever way you want to look at it, in his approved judgment after the hearing that the bank had signed the purported contract, which they hadn't. Huge error in law and in fact. So when we put that before the same judge in an ex parte hearing for an emergency injunction to stop a fire sale of all the trust properties, the same judge came before us and he said to me, well, this is the same as before, isn't it? Come on, admit it. I said, no, this isn't the same as before. And he went, oh, how's that? And I said, well, the first issue that we have to deal with is the fact that, with all due respect, you made a fundamental error in your judgment. And he went, oh, how was that? And I said, well, I can show you if you want. The document that you described in your approved judgment, and I named the paragraph, and I said, I can show you. No, no, that's all right. I said, the document that you described was signed by the bank, wasn't signed by the bank. And I said, I've got it here. Do you want to see it? And I start going, and he said, no, no, no. I accept, I accept what you're saying, and that I may have made an error. <laughs> we dad's up going on now, because we expected a railroading from the same judge who railroaded us originally. He thought he was part of the conspiracy, and he revealed that he wasn't. Because he said, actually, if you've got any, any other evidence that this injunction needs to be issued, you might have a cause of action. I said, well, it's funny you should say that. Because we had never been provided with one, one of the copies of one of the purported mortgages. So we did, and we went to the land registry and we asked for the official office copy entry of every registration pertaining to the property. And what we got was something, well, it was a big surprise. But for once, it was a very good surprise. The surprise was the bank had made a mortgage in the name of the Nelson Trust, which is the name of the Family Property Trust. But this was a limited company in Gloucestershire, in Strand. The trust isn't a limited company. They put the wrong name, the wrong Nelson Trust, on the document. And more than that, there was no space for witnesses, and it wasn't witnessed. So we had them on both levels completely, and he went, why wasn't this disclosed in the original proceedings? I said, well, if you remember rightly, we did make an application for full disclosure of all these documents, and you dismissed it as totally without merit. He went, right, yes, yes, we've been over that. Remember, I'm actually trying to help you here. I'm not averse to granting injunctions. Please give me a chance. I do not have your encyclopedic knowledge of this place, and I do make mistakes. Yeah, shocking. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, so now we're talking. And I thought, we've got a chance to get this injunction. I said, what would it take for you to issue this injunction? What would it take? He said, well, I'm not going to issue it. I said, well, you just said it. He said, yes, yes, I know. I'm not saying that you haven't got grounds, and I'm not going to dismiss it. I'm going to adjourn it to another high court judge, because I, it needs to be a specialist. And there are two judges who specialize in this area, Kay and Barons. Which would you like me to get for you? You've been before Kay, and I believe he was quite nice to you. So do you want me to get him? And we agreed. It was adjourned for a few weeks. The fire sale of the properties didn't go ahead. We, we also issued criminal proceedings for fraud by false representation, fraud by non-disclosure, and fraud by abusive position against the receivers in an attempt to stop them going through with the fire sale, they were summoned to a magistrate's court. And I was allowed to present the case by a district judge 
under power of attorney, and he agreed that I wasn't there in name. I was there in, the, in my name. I was there in the name of the trustees under the power of attorney because it was validly executed under the power of attorney act 1971. Now, when this happened, when we went before Kay and Michael witnessed it, who knows why, but Judge Kay had turned into a psychotic. <laughs> and I thought it was just he'd been wheeled in to deal with a hot potato and he's pissed off with me, but literally it was every five seconds he was jumping in. No, 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 you can't say that just isn't true. This application isn't put together properly. And if it wasn't for the fact that he was doing the same to the barrister say, how could you expect me to grant what you're asking for, which I might be minded to, because there's clearly no merit in the applications before me, but yours is just as bad. <laughs> Hour and a half of this. Hour and a half, and finally got so exasperated when I refused to back down, and I refused to be intimidated, and I was biding me time, waiting for him to just go, <sighs> as he pulled his hair out. And he did. And he said, oh, this is just becoming tedious. You're bringing up the same points again and again. And I says, you want to try fighting miscarriages of justice in the courts? See how tedious that is. And he went, quite. <laughs> so, inevitably, it, was, it wasn't dismissed as totally without merit. He passed the hot potato on to the next judge, and then he decided, no, no, he was going to adjourn it to himself. And we found out through the court that he was going to be presiding again at the next hearing, and we knew that he was going to grant it to the opposition because he virtually dictated what their application should be in the court and told them that he would be minded to grant an extended civil restraint order against me and the trustees to prevent us from making any further actions. So, we, we got notice that there was going to be a directions hearing in July 2013, and that that hearing was going to be before K again. So we made an application, an informal application, not using one of their forms, to have the judge recused, which is removed from the case, or to remove himself from the case, on the basis that he, did, he had shown extreme prejudice towards us and extreme bias towards them, which meant that he had become an advocate for the other party, which is against the rules. And he must recuse himself, and we gave him the case law. And he did recuse himself, but he never admitted that he had. And they wheeled out someone called the Vice Chancellor of the County Palatine of Lancaster. Right. <laughs> Norris. Oh. Norris. Norris, in July 2013, he came out and he looked like this and he said, you're only going to get permission to talk under my terms. He says, I'm not going to listen to any power of attorney nonsense. The power of attorney cannot ever be successful in, in sustaining an argument that you have the right to exercise a right of audience before me. You do not. You only have the power to exercise a right of audience if I say you can under the Legal Services Act. Now I might agree to let you do that if you agree that you have no right to appear here under power of attorney and that you accept that the worst case scenario for you is that you get a wasted costs order against you and you have to pay for all these proceedings. You. And I said, with all due respect, which was not with all due respect, that is incorrect in fact and law. He says, I'm not listening to it. Do you understand that that is the only way you are going to be able to speak on behalf of the trustees who apparently want you to do so? It, unless you accept, no one's going to be heard today. And I'm going to deal with the applications regardless. So I conferred with the trustees and, we, and they said, look, it's the only thing we can do. He's obviously going to shaft us with that attitude. And then he sat there for four and a half hours, letting me speak and letting their barrister sweat as much as I am now. And I went through every single point, every single piece of case law. He made all the notes, but the only questions he, had, he asked were pertaining to the facts. Because he already had a prepared judgment and he was just filling in the details. He was asking the questions pertaining to facts that he didn't yet have in order, in order to construct a preconceived judgment. And the purpose of doing this was purely for him to do something so illegal and ridiculous that every single lawyer and barrister I've ever spoken to said, don't you, uh, honestly, now, now you're taking the piss. No, uh, no judge would ever try something as ludicrous as that. I said, this guy did. And what he did was, I was beneficiary, and still am, of the property trust. 
Because of that, under the Trustee Act, under their rules of the Trustee Act 2000, no beneficiary can act as a representative or agent of a trustee. So I couldn't act under their statute. And we said, you, you can't appoint me to act for, as a representative of the trustees. It's not only in breach of the trustee, it's in breach of that act. And he said, that's the only way this is going to happen. And he ignored the law completely. He didn't care. And the reason he did it is because as soon as I accepted, or the trustees accepted, that I could only proceed acting in their name under his permission, he then made me a party to the claim. He made me one of the trustees, which I am not allowed in law or equity to do. So it's in breach of the statute, and it's in breach of the trustee, which created the trust. He didn't care. And why did he do it? Because that was the only way that he could impose extended civil restraint orders, banning us all from every single civil court, without getting the permission of the judge that he put as gatekeeper, and so he could hit us all, including me, for costs, so that we could be made bankrupt because they'd already stolen most of the assets and certainly all of the income. There was nothing left. And he knew this. So, obviously my dad and the other trustees, they're thinking that everything's it's gone at this point. It's gone, they're just gonna, they're gonna take my parents' property and they're gonna take my sister's property and the other one property that was left, the one with the, the mortgage with the wrong name on. And they were, I mean, I have to say that they were losing. And at this point, the, the solicitor who'd been acting as trustee he was told by his insurer solicitors that he couldn't, even have, he couldn't even have any conversations with us anymore. This is a friend of my dad of 25, 30 years. He wasn't allowed to communicate with him until further notice. Otherwise, he lost the protection of his professional indemnity insurance policy. Okay, let's just stop and give evidence against them. So, to his credit, before they ordered him that he couldn't communicate with us, he put in... 13 applications against the 13 properties to have all of the mortgages struck out on all of the grounds that I've been over because he said he realised that he, he had actually performed illegal conveyances, not knowing. Not knowing. And they said, don't do that ever again. Don't have anything to do with it. You're not allowed to speak to them. You're not allowed to give your name to any document. None. And it all went quiet. The fraud upon the court claim... The, we got an acknowledgement of service from the bank and its receivers saying that they were going to defend it vigorously and apply it to have it all chucked out was totally without merit. They didn't put in the defence. And it got to the point where we won. We had to fall judgment, which is an administrative thing. It's not a judicial issue. It's an administrative issue because they had to issue a default judgment on the simple basis that there was no defence from the bank within the allotted time, and no defence from their receivers either. Around the day that this was due to be issued, Judge Behrens, who'd been appointed gatekeeper of the extended civil restraint orders, he chucked the whole thing out as totally without merit, even though every point was sustained and there was no defence had been issued by the bank and the receivers. In other words, we'd won, and in an order of the court's own motion, he said it was all totally without merit. All of them. The same judge, last July in Leeds, agreed that it wasn't totally without merit after all. And he ruled that we were right, that Section 1-3 of the 1989 Act and Section 2 of the 1989 Act had to be applied. And for that reason, one of the mortgages was struck out. It was cancelled as being void. And it took six months, but we eventually got the Chief Land Registrar to knock it out after the property chamber ordered that it must be. Now, none of this happened because the judges decided one day, you know, we really should start doing justice over mortgages. You know, we're, we're, it's gonna end in pitchforks. We started playing a different game, you see. We stopped going in, into their rigged game and in expecting a different result. We went in knowing that they were trying to shaft us, so we had to play chess, the long game. We had to understand that we were able, because of their chronic myopia caused by extreme arrogance, they couldn't foresee the consequences of their actions. And we got them in a position where the only thing that could happen was Judge Behrens had to concede that the 1989 Act had to be applied, that at least one mortgage was void, and then he pretended that the bank had still won and said, I'm still going to give the bank the right to create a new mortgage in the name of the trustees, and he then appointed the retired trustee, the solicitor, and said, you don't have a choice here. And his solicitor said, you don't have a choice here. 
He had to sign, when he didn't have the power and authority to do anything for the trustees anymore, he had to sign a new void mortgage, which they've been trying to get registered now, unsuccessfully, for 11 months. And the reason they can't get it registered, because before they did, we'd already put in an objection to the land reg chief land registrar, saying they're going to try and do this, we know they're going to try and do it, and it's completely void and illegal, and the property chamber have already ruled on the issue that yes, if they don't comply with section 1.3, they have to be cancelled and they have to order the chief land registrar to do that. And at the same time, the criminal proceedings that we issued against the bank and its receivers in North Shields Magistrates Court, the stay that was placed on them was placed on them for one reason, and that was because we hadn't had any of the mortgages cancelled at the land registry. Now we have. We're expecting next week or the week after for the same judge to lift the stay on the proceedings for one reason. At the end of the hearing in the magistrate's court, he commended me on the way I'd handled the case. And he says, to be quite frank, you put a lot of my fellow professionals to shame. So you know how to take a point and you know how to make one. And any time you come back and wanting to act under power of attorney for any party, I'd be happy to have you in my court. <coughs> wow, what a difference compared to all the rest. And I, I, I can only say that the reason was, it appears to me that there are scattered about the place some judges who don't yet quite realise the corruption that's going on and they try to do the right thing in a rigged system, which is very difficult at the best of times. But this guy, he made a warning. After, this, after putting the stay on and saying, I have to stay these as vexatious because there's civil restraint orders against you all, and I'm not able to do anything else because the land registry haven't corrected the register, but if they cancel just one of those mortgages, or if a court rules that just one of those mortgages is void, if those receivers and the bank will have to be joined to the claim as well because they are equally responsible, if they do not reach a fair and quick settlement of compensation, they will be proceeding to trial for fraud as you have alleged, and I'd allow it to proceed in the way it is now. <coughs> that stay is about to be lifted. So, has anybody got any questions before we wrap up for the first hour? I think we're the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Very good question, and I think it's a good one to, to kind of wrap up this session with because we'll deal with all, all the other questions at the end, but that is a particularly good question, and here's why. Every single mortgagor who takes the illegal advice of a conveyancing solicitor does so in good faith, not knowing that it's a fraudulent transaction that they're executing. That means they cannot be held accountable. Their hands are clean. Their hands are clean. And because this normally results in their names being registered as registered proprietors, which is another way of saying they have legal title to it, and equitable, as long as they stay within whatever covenants exist within a mortgage transaction, for instance. When that mortgage transaction is declared void, the mortgagor owns the property free and clear. There's nothing they can do, because possession means an awful lot in the law, as you know, because they say it's nine-tenths of the law. Okay, so does that answer your question? Yeah. In other words, if 11.2 million mortgagors, if they all made this application to the land registry for a kickoff, none of the land registries wouldn't be able to cope. Neither would the courts. But the entire system would grind to a halt. Because ultimately, if nobody has a valid and enforceable legal mortgage, they have an illegal and void one. And if every mortgagor made a successful application of the land registry on an AP1, that's the name of the form, which goes along with a witness statement to attest to the facts. If everyone was successful, as we have been with the first one, and I know it's a, it's a domino effect in slow motion that we're witnessing. If everyone did that, every single family living in a void mortgage property would be free and clear of their encumbrances <coughs> and they couldn't have their home taken away from them by the banks. As you can see, I'm in my second shirt. Uh, definitely the winner of the wet shirt competition in the first half. And if this one doesn't cause as much sweat, I'm going to be kicking myself because this is what I wore up until five minutes before I arrived. So we'll see, we'll see. Right, 
What I want to stress, I know I've stressed it already, what I want to stress is if we have a system where justice is never served when justice needs to be done, we have, by definition, a tyrannical system. Now, who in this room is aware that every, apart from Rob, obviously, who in this room is aware that every single county, city, and borough council has signed up to the UN Declaration of Human Rights? Right. Okay. Now, what that means is that they are bound by every single ruling, charter, and convention of the United Nations even the ones that they haven't signed. That means that the terms of Agenda 21, which is a long-term plan to reduce the population of the Earth by up to 85% by whatever means they deem to be necessary. I will list the means. Geoengineering, in order to poison the air that we breathe. Fluoride and all kinds of toxic substances such as mercury in the water supply to impede and eventually destroy along with poisonous and toxic pharmaceuticals that they attempt to get us addicted to from an early age for two reasons. If we're dependent upon what they're giving us in any way, we are their slaves. Any kind of benefit, any kind of medical intervention, food, water, resources of all natures. They are deliberately destroying the family unit by stealing and trafficking children for profit in the adoption industry. Uh, signs in Nottingham every few hundred yards at a certain point in the city centre with a big smiling child and the headline is one child placed into care every day. Can you help? They're touting for business and at the same time rubbing the, no the noses of all the activists who've been trying to expose this child trafficking and child abuse international racket that has not only been thriving, it is one of the growth industries of the tyrannical state that has imposed itself upon us. You've got members of councils and ex-social workers who are confirming that they are being told to find any pretext at all from smoking to having undone dishes in the sink when you've got parents looking after three kids on their own, you know, they, oh, you're an unfit parent, there's dishes in the sink. Any pretext at all. As if that wasn't bad enough, in your name, in the name of the British people, millions, millions and millions of innocent men, women and children, an estimated 400 million Civilians have been killed by governments in the last hundred years alone. And you might think, well, we've had a lot of wars, you know, there is a lot of people though. That does not include anybody who was considered an innocent casualty in any war. I have nothing to do with the state anymore. They don't even write to me. They don't come after me for tax because they established beyond all doubt that they could not prove I was a taxpayer. I refuse to give a single penny to the government in tax that was going to fund the slaughter of other people's children in foreign climes. All of my property, every bit of it, is in a private living trust. That private living trust is, some, is otherwise known as a bear or spendthrift trust. This means <coughs> that the sole purpose of the trust is to make the maximum beneficial interest from all the property in it for the dual purposes of the maintenance and education of the beneficiaries who are my children and my wife. And they wrote to my wife, trying to frighten her, saying, your daughter will never have the right to an education, she will never have the right to a passport, you are making her life so difficult. And this is five years ago. No one had ever done this to my knowledge. And I crafted a declaration, which was a declaration laying it down that me and my wife had superior guardianship rights over our children and we were not willing to give them up for any reason. And they could not demonstrate that there would be one single benefit worth having through registering her birth. Furthermore, we declared 
that we were not going to be party to the swindle that they perpetrated against everybody born and registered on these shores and their parents, which is the birth certificate, though something differently, is not a bond. It isn't. It is evidence of a birth of a child of the state, which results in the National Debt Commissioners instructing the, upon notice of that birth and that certificate being in existence, they instruct the Comptroller General on behalf of the National Debt Commissioners, there's a clue there why they're doing it, to reduce the national debt, so-called. They create what is called a life annuity in the name of every child. A life annuity is like creating credit out of thin air. Every month it pays a certain value and you, if you're creating or if you are the owner of, of a life annuity, you can set the value of that annuity and it gains a certain amount of interest, a minimum of 8% every year. If the beneficiary of that life annuity, which is every child registered, do, does not claim within the first seven years of their life the beneficial interest of that life annuity, it is automatically a sheeted as abandoned property into the government's consolidated fund, which is basically their war chest. And we explain this and why we wouldn't be party to it in any way. Because what they're doing is, whatever anyone says about them deeming us legally dead, it's not the case. And I'll tell you why. Because all those life annuities which were brought into being under the Government Annuities Act 1929, and in the original form, which I happen to have, even though you can't get it online anywhere else, in the original form of that Act, which was subsequently amended, what did any individual who was the beneficiary of a life annuity that they created in their name, or their parents, what did they have to provide as evidence that they were entitled to it to the, to the Comptroller General? Birth certificate. Not as a form of identity, as it says on the birth certificate, not to be used for ident identification purposes, but to prove that there was a registration of a child of a state, and it states in that act, in the Government New Year's Act 1929, it states very clearly that what the beneficiary is then entitled to, once they prove that they're alive and were entitled to the beneficial interests, is all of the beneficial interest that was due to them in their life plus interest. Up to three times whatever they would have had if they'd been claiming it from the beginning. Now, can everyone see that there's absolutely no need to deposit any form of bond which is a promise to pay when you can create credit and it's perpetual credit every quarter. And here's the thing. Unless someone submits a death certificate, the annuity doesn't end. So all the annuities they've ever created are still alive, even though the true beneficiaries are dead. When they realised that we knew the worst they could do, even under their rules, was issue us a fine, which I think at the time was £4, and they never wrote back to us again. However, we did make an application to the passport office because everybody born here has the right to a passport, even if they're not a British citizen, just because they were born here or because their parents were born here. And this is because they monopolised the borders long ago and you have no other means of travelling across them unless you've got some form of acceptable document that is generally issued by them. What I'm saying to you is the passport office said... You'll never get a passport. We, we, if you don't give us a birth certificate, there's no way we're going to give you a passport. How many weeks do you think it took for us to get the passport? One. Six. Six, yes. Until it was handed to a senior uh, official in the management structure who actually went and checked what the regulations were. All the staff just freaked out. We can't do this. We've got no regulation for it. She said, they're right. There is no regulation for it, but that is being addressed because we have realised that there is no law or rule preventing anyone from getting a passport if they haven't got a birth certificate. So they, have, they gave us the passport. We had a health worker come at, at, at six month intervals until she was two, to base, and, and we opened the door and said, we're, we're not hiding anything we want you to see. And we explained the reasons why we didn't register. 
and both her and the family doctor, having had it all, it all explained to them, they said, well, it is the first time we've come across anything like this, but we've both talked long and hard about it, and we were very upset that we had to come and do this and just turn up on our door on the orders of the local authority, so-called. But, having had everything explained to us, we don't think there's anything wrong with what you've done, and we are supporting you 100%. And the health worker admitted that every single box she ticked was A1. She said, I'm, I'm accepting that you're not choosing to register on moral grounds, and also, you don't want any interference with the state, and that is your choice. Since then, all we've had is a letter from the local authorities' representative in the school that she would have gone to, had she gone to school. The school wanted to do a preschool assessment. We told them, sorry, like, we're not doing any of that. And explained the reasons why. She was being home educated and she wasn't going to go to school. And eventually, their senior representative, who was a teacher at that local school, said, look, I don't have any choice here, but I need to basically do an assessment of the reasons why you're not sending your child to school. So my wife, um, as is her one, she wrote a letter in about 10 minutes flat and gave it to me and said, what do you think of this? I said, I wouldn't change a word, let's send it straight away. And it explained in no uncertain terms that we didn't need anything from the state, that our daughter was, be was being educated in a, a radical new kind of way, which perhaps is a way that it used to be done in the past, but this way was allowing her to decide what she wanted to learn. And as a consequence, she loves to do dance, she loves to do drama, she loves to sing, she's already playing scales on the, on the piano, she's got grade seven trampoline. She played football with the, with, with the local boys team. It, it, it's, the, it's the best boys team in the area, and it's the five-year-old team. And the, the, the boys didn't want her there. They said, girls can't play football, and someone pushed her. And she didn't fall over, but he did when she pushed him back. says, well, you haven't met me, have you? Because I've been kicking the ball since I could walk. And since then, she has been sent off for naughtiness three times. You know why she was sent off? Because the boys couldn't get it through their heads how she was allowed not to go to school. And she said, listen, you don't have to go to school. It's just the government that forced you to go to school. You can be home educated, like I am. Then, then you wouldn't have to go and be locked up in that prison. She was four at the time. She's now five. She's moved on a lot since then. Going on 25. Going on 25, exactly. Now... Every time we walk past that local school that she would have gone to, every time she, she, she goes quiet, and as Mike Lowe confirmed, she doesn't go quiet very often, except when she sleeps. And every single time we go past, she goes quiet, she says the same thing. I feel so sorry for those children in there, Daddy. And I feel so sorry for their mammies and daddies. Because surely no mammy and daddy would want their children to be locked up like that. And it... She doesn't yet, because of her age, know the full extent of what's being done. But let's just put things into perspective. How many people in this room were taught at school that the history of these lands and these islands pretty much boils down to we were a bunch of savages, there was no civilization here, and we were civilized by the Romans, and they took over when they invaded, and they civilized us, and then the Romans, when the Roman Empire fell, then it was the Anglo-Saxons and the Jutes, they came here, the Vikings came here and tried to invade a few times, and eventually everyone was conquered by the Normans a thousand years ago, and that's the way it's been ever since. Mm -hmm. That's the way it's been ever since. Now, first things first, who in this room has heard of the Mong Time Laws? Right, then the small percentage will know the Mong Time Laws predate the Norman Conquest by 1400 years. The Marmotine laws were more like a set of rules of equity, because they were all about justice. Now I'm going to give you just a taste of what the Marmotine laws set in stone for the people. Any tyrannical ruler or government or monarch can be removed by a unanimous convention of the people, in whatever form that takes. In other words, if everyone in their local area formed a convention and held a public meeting, and held a vote on whether or not their local council should be removed on the basis that they are implementing an Agenda 21 policy or set of policies, if that vote was carried by a majority, that regime could be legitimately, under international law, removed. 
and we just start doing it the way it should be done. Another thing the Mormon time laws <coughs> proclaimed was that no man or woman is born with any more rights than any other. You take that out of the current system and the purported authority of the establishment fades away to nothing. Because it's all inherited, including the system. Now, another Mormon time law. Everyone born on these shores is entitled to five acres of land. Entitled. Another one of the Mormon time laws is the people are above the monarch at all times. The monarch is only fulfilling a role, and that role prior to the Anglo-Saxons coming here as immigrants and then attacking to perform their own genocide. They, they managed to take the southeast corner of, of Britain, but they didn't manage to take the rest. And they eventually started living in peace during the time of Alfred the Great, because Alfred the Great was petitioned. He was petitioned by his own people to adopt the Mormontine laws the way the Britons lived, because they worked so well. Monarchs were voted in. Their role in the Mormontine laws was purely to act as something which many people may know as a rex. A rex was someone who protected the people. That was their job, to, to organize the protection of the people whenever necessary, in times of invasion and attempted conquest. How many people know that the Roman hordes were repelled from these shores, not once, not twice, but three times, and that they never ever took the Britons into servitude at a time when they had no other, no other issues in the rest of their empire they could not take the Britons down for one reason. Because every single community was formed as a sovereign community of sovereign people. And they had the power and they ran it as pretty much implied family trusts. The family chose someone to vote at the conventions but they could all vote if they wanted to, if, they, if there was a, a disagreement within a clan, etc. Now, what was the only duty of the people, of rather, what was the only duty of the men during this time? The only duty? Mm -hmm. to, protect. to defend and protect whenever necessary. Mm -hmm. The only people who were exempted were the bards, the druids, and engineers. And do you know why the engineers were exempted? Because on these shores, and I've seen all the historical evidence, and it is quite frankly breathtaking, on these shores, they had chariots, and the, on, the, on, the, on the wheels of the chariots, they had huge spikes, and they, used, they were incredibly well, so incredibly well designed, with one horse, they could take these chariots effortlessly into the sea as the Romans and anyone else was getting off the ships. They never made it to the beach most of the time. The first time Julius Caesar in 54 BC brought the legions, and this is the, 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 the famed greatest general of, of, of the empire of Rome the greatest master tactician they ever produced. And he wrote in his own memoirs that twice, twice he was repelled by the Britons and that the legionnaires could not cope with the level of engineering in the weaponry of the Britons. And they never went to conquer lands. They went to set them free. And in 340 BC, the son of King Malmatine, who wrote the laws, he was called uh, Brennus. He led the Britons to the sack of Rome. Rome was taken, taken in to the British Empire, the original one, only the purpose was for everyone to live under the Mormontine laws. They set the slaves free. They never took slaves. And everybody who moved here had the same rights as every indigenous Briton after seven generations. But until that time, if they abided by the Mormontine laws, they would be treated as if they'd been born here. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this, and if you check out my podcast, video podcast, The Fraud of English History and The Rise of UCT, you will see all of this documented from so many sources. Now, why would they play such a huge fraud over history? Because the history of these lands is the history 
are of ordinary men and women standing up to tyranny and saying no more of this shit. In the time of Boudicca, everyone know who Boudicca is? Yeah. She was the Iceni queen following the death of her husband. She had taken, or rather her husband and her had taken, the first loan from, what was, what, who, who, from a man who was described as a grinding usurer of Rome around about, I think it was, around about the time of the Claudian invasion, which would be around about 32... Um, AD onwards. Now, there was civil war on these lands over territories and over getting into bed with the commerce of the Romans and the usurers. They didn't want usury here. And essentially, what united all of the warring clans was one thing. Boudicca, after slaughtering an estimated 100,000 legionnaires, the greatest loss the Romans had ever had in any battle. After that battle, they sought revenge on Boudicca and her family. And they took her prisoner, the Romans, and they tied her up and made her watch as her, I believe it was three daughters, were raped. Gang raped. That message, and you might ask how, the message that that had happened travelled the country in 12 minutes through this, the, the, the communication system that they had, which was pyres on the top of mountains, yeah. right around the lands, and they could send anything in smoke signals, and there was always someone on guard for that very reason. Immediately, without a convention, without you know getting together on the internet and organising something because it didn't exist or anything like that, they all united on one reason. Not on this island. That will not happen. It can't happen because if it happens to one, it could happen to all. How many politicians is it going to take to be found upon the evidence alone to be guilty of paedophilia, torture, and kidnapping of children? How many more politicians need to be accused of that before the people of these lands say, no more shit, it's got to stop. It's exactly like the lead character in Network said. When is everyone going to stand up and say, I'm mad and I'm not going to take it anymore? And I always feel better after saying that. <laughs> but I learned to channel my anger in the right direction. Because it isn't good enough for us just to get angry. As I said, we have to take action. Now I'm going to tell you a series of things that you can do to take action without delay. If you have the inclination and the courage to do it. No matter what your situation is, the two most important things that need to happen on these shores now is a grassroots, organic rise of grand juries in every community. Grand juries were the last option for people who'd suffered miscarriages of justice at the hands of the government-run courts to go and seek to have a verdict quashed by a grand jury which is outside the reach of any government. Any government at all. And in 1933, through the Administration of Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Act, they purported to ban the grand jury when the grand jury is nothing but a product of the real common law of Britain, not England. Britain predates England by so long, it's almost laughable that we've all been hoodwinked on this issue, but they've tried to erase all visible evidence that this is the case. They have no right under international law to conquer any territory and keep it. This territory has been occupied for the last th almost a thousand years. What the Normans did, the Normans weren't French. The Normans were the men from the north. They were what was left of the, for the want of a better expression, the diaspora from Scandinavia who was seeking new abundant territories. And this one was always famous for being the land of milk and honey. But that's a different part of the equation which I will come back to. And I promise you it's worth waiting for. 
The fact is that there is, there is and has never been any legitimacy in this monarchy. Never. Ever. For one reason. The indigenous peoples of Britain were taken and slaughtered by conquest. Nothing has changed except the names. Nothing. Now, why is it that no monarchy can be legitimate in such circumstances? Does anyone know? Because they're below be the people. Beca because they're below the people. Yeah. Now, has no system of law and equity existed prior to their invasion as they claim? under the law of occupation, under international law, they would have a right to civilise us. However, they've erased so much of what transpired on these islands because, as I said, if we were all taught this in schools, we would never get fooled anywhere near as many times over so many things. Because it's everything. It's absolutely everything. It's not just the banking swindle, it's the historical swindle, it's the health swindle, it's the legal swindle, it goes on and on. However, one grand jury in every area who can sit and convene with a minimum of, of 13 and a maximum of 25 people, and they've got to be at least 13 turn up, and all they hear are the allegations of somebody who claims to be an injured party, they don't hear the defence, the defence isn't even notified, the grand jury merely sits and decides whether or not there's a case to answer. And if they decide there's a case to answer, then a petty jury, which again is founded upon the Mormontine principles, a convention of the people, to sort out a dispute or to, to solve a crime for whatever reason. The petty jury is formed and you don't require a judge, you just require the jury and all of, all of the people, the administrators that you need to make sure everything's done properly under the old common law, which again, I put out a podcast about um, John Hurst has, uh, has done some fantastic work on grand juries and more and more people are starting to talk about them. And of course, last October, the first grand jury since 1933 heard allegations that the, all of the attempts to make Britain part of the EU are illegal and void. That's the first decision of the first grand jury. The second decision was that the 1933 Act, that's the, the, the Administration of Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1933, was also void because no government has the jurisdiction to interfere with a grand jury in any way. Now, let's imagine that instead of having to go into their three-ring circus and to try, to try in vain to obtain justice through war of attrition, to go to a grand jury of your local peers and to present it to them and say, look, do you think there's a case to answer? And if they say yes, you proceed to a petty jury and you hold it. That petty jury is capable of, of deciding that an order should be made by the court that's been convened. You don't need anybody except the administrative officials at that point. So the order is issued that the arrest of the guilty party must take place or they have to be brought to trial, one way or the other, if they refuse to play ball. They can't subvert these principles because their bullshit system is purportedly founded upon them. They wouldn't expect this. They certainly wouldn't expect a sudden rise of peacekeepers in every community either. And that's the second thing that we need in every community. Volunteer peacekeepers. Yes? Michael, how can we enforce the grand jury? Through peacekeepers. If we had, let's say, 250 as a, as a starting block, 250 volunteers from all walks of life, from all backgrounds in that area who feel strongly about something needing to be done. It is nothing but what was done two and three thousand years ago. It's our duty to protect our own. We can't do anything else. So if we go in and we say, right, we've got 250 peacekeepers here to arrest this MP um, because a grand jury has, it, has decided that there is a case to answer and he needs to put in his plea before a jury, before a petty jury. I can tell you that the Treaty of Universal Community Trust that we entered into on the summer solstice 2012, it offers to every indigenous man, woman and child on this planet the protection of the treaty in any set of circumstances once they declare that they are standing under the terms of the treaty. 
and it's a seven page document with a video that goes with it and I, I suggest you look it up if you haven't seen it already but it boils down to one straightforward divine maxim which I think everyone is going to immediately understand and recognize in their hearts my rights end only where yours begin in other words do no harm but take no shit and that should be the whole of the law nothing else Yes, yes, that's a good point. That is a good point. But we, we have to redefine certain words because of how they've been misused. I absolutely agree. But under the former definition, prior to the Roman invasions, the definition of peace was tranquility. Mm -hmm. It was nothing more. Yeah. And then it was the laws of war which made it something else. There are currently in excess of 250 peacekeepers by the last estimation now who volunteered. And there is a basic agreement that they're going to stand under the protection of the UCT treaty. Because beyond no illusions, what this does is it takes you out of their jurisdiction. And all you have to do is make a declaration to that effect, formally, in whatever form it takes. And then they cannot claim that you are subject to their jurisdiction, unless you still are dependent upon the state in some way. Now, that is why they work so hard to make sure that the vast majority are dependent on the state in some way. But I'm telling you, from someone who's done it, and from someone who knows others who've done it, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's almost impossible if you've got a family and you're getting screwed left, right, and centre, and you just you need the benefits to make ends meet. But I can tell you, in the event that you and your family have the courage to have nothing more to do with them and to refuse to pay tax on moral grounds because you are financing terrorism by the state in other lands and these lands. Terrorism. Look up the, the origin of the word terrorism and you will see what it really means. It means the use of force by government to subordinate the people. Terrorism. The war on terror, war of terror. That's what they're waging. Given all of that, why is it that they're panicking so much that there are so many false flag attacks or allegations of false flag attacks? Why is it that they're doing this now when everybody who, who is anybody in the financial world and the investment world is saying, run for the hills because it's going to be the biggest of all time, this crash. The biggest investors in stocks globally now at this moment and for the past six months are getting everything out of the financial markets, all their investments. Hedge funds are turning down billions every day by giving the money back to the investors because they know something big is coming. What that is, is solely going to be determined by how the people of these lands and others react to what is going to go down within the next six months. What I am proposing is that everybody who sees this video, wherever you are, if there isn't a, a peace or tranquility keeping group, in your area, start one. If there isn't already, and there are at least a dozen that have sprung up all around the country already, if there isn't a grand jury operating in your area under the protection of UCT, you start one and, and, and put it around in your local community or on the internet, whatever there. If a miscarriage of justice has been imposed upon people, they can come to you and convene a grand jury and the grand jury will decide if there's a case to answer and take it from there. If everybody as well as taking on that responsibility, who sees this video, goes out and just refuses to comply with the orders of tyrants, no matter what the consequences, the consequences will become less and less and less until there aren't any at all. Because believe one thing if you believe anything, or rather take as truth one thing if you take anything as truth from today. The only reason that we are in this position is because we deferred our responsibility for our own lives to the big daddy of the state. Because it looked like it was easier. From cradle to grave, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that, in one word, communism. Communism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The universal, the universal living wage that so many people are desperate to happen, that so many people will be appeased by, 
one of the, the fundamental planks of communism. What do you think National Socialism is really? National Communism. Everyone got paid a universal living wage decided by the state. Anybody telling you that Hitler was really a hero has either not read history or they're ignoring it to suit their own agenda. Just look up the T4 program, a euthanasia program which took out in two years in excess of 200,000 undesirables. <coughs> Who were those undesirables? Disabled. All kinds of people. Disabled. Not any one denomination of faith, not any one race. It, they even took out some so-called Aryans. They took out everybody who could potentially be a threat to the imposition of national communism. There is no legitimate form of collectivist government. That means there's no legitimate form of democratic government. And the reason is simple. Hang on a second. The reason is simple. No democratic government that has ever existed in known history did not oppress those who did not comply. That's not freedom. That's oppression. Therefore, democracy is a pathetic belief in the collective wisdom. Of there you go. Lincoln. There you go. Yeah. Absolutely. So what I'm saying is, just the understanding of one basic maxim of equity, my rights end where yours begin, do no harm but take no shit, is all any of us need to understand about what is right and what is wrong, about how to determine it. It's like, right, okay, well, have you done harm to me? Well, if you punch me in the face for no good reason, you've done harm to me. If I was, if I was trying to break into your house and you've knocked me out clean with a baseball bat, I have no claim against you if I die. It was my fault. I did a wrongdoing and you were scared for your safety and you took me out. That is a principle of common law echoed by Lord Denning in the Court of Appeal many times. Many people during that time of Lord Denning's reign, and he was reigning, but not as a monarch. He was going around banging on the doors of all the judges who were doing terrible things and saying, you better watch, I've got my eye on you, you need to reverse this. And I've had this from three different people who actually were before Denning, who said they used to walk and tremble down the corridor when they went to his office. The most senior of the law lords. I'm not saying he was a perfect man, I didn't know him, so I don't know that, but I know that way, way beyond any other judge in the history of the so-called English law, he made judgments that benefited the people. And instead of twisting the facts to make them suit the Crown interests, he made them so that they were just and fair to the people. We are now living under a tyranny that has declared that self-defence is not a legal right. Someone comes and twats you in the street. You're not allowed to defend yourself. Hit him back, stop him. Take his, kick his knife out of his hand. So they say. But they can only impose that upon everybody who they deem to be one of their subject citizen tax slaves. The only way that you can get out of their jurisdiction is to declare that you stand under another one, even if it's only your own. However, now more than any other time, I think in the known history of these lands and everywhere else on this earth, we need, and I'm talking to everybody on the front line, wherever you are, whatever you stand for, we need to agree on one thing in order to stop this tyranny everywhere. We need to agree the government is the problem. You can't solve a problem <coughs> with another version of the problem. You can only solve it with the solution. And the solution is about as straightforward as it can be. A voluntary association of the self-governed living under the general principles of natural law. Not man-made law, natural law. My rights end where yours begin. Do no harm but take no shit. And if you do harm, <laughs> expect some shit. Because you deserve it. Why is it, do you think, that dogs and other animals, when, we're, when we treat them with love and compassion, and we're not cruel to them, and they can see it in our eyes that we, we don't have any, any malice for them. We don't have any cruelty to dish out. Why do they look in our eyes and love us? Why? My theory, and it is a theory, other people have got different ones, my theory is that it's because, like other animals, when we're not in a combative situation with them, they instinctively feel bit different this one, 
bit different for one reason. We can discern. We can discern what's right and wrong. They can't. They act instinctively to protect themselves, to survive, to procreate, you know, to protect who they love, who they cherish. That's it. It's programmed in them. Just like it's programmed in mankind to know it doesn't matter what bullshit you've been fed on a drip for your entire life, to know in your heart mankind was born to live free in harmony with nature and each other. That doesn't mean we have to agree about everything. It just means we have to understand what constitutes our common unity, which issues they are. And they are, every one of us, every one of us is entitled to a place to live, to raise a family and grow our own food. In, on clean land, in clean air, and to have a supply of clean water. Every one of us. That's the base, those are just the basics. Every one of us has the right to expect that our friends and neighbours will not turn their back because they're getting bunts every month, getting paid by government institutions who are just set up to take everything they can from the people as efficiently and quickly as possible in the most deceptive, devi devious and dastardly manners. It is not acceptable to turn your back for any reason. So what I'm saying is, and again, I've been building up to this, there is one other thing that would bring this entire country to an absolute standstill, and that is if nobody, doesn't matter who you work for, where you work, what you do, if you work for a corporation or a government agency, you stop working for them and you get everybody else who you work with, however long it takes to agree to stop working for them, to refuse to turn the cogs of the system and actually realise that when you do cut yourself free off from the state and do not depend on their benefit privileges anymore, the universe will provide opportunities which it wouldn't if you continued to do the job that is helping turn the cogs of the tyranny. It does, because I know I've done it and I've seen other people do it. And also, be under no illusions, there isn't anybody speaking out currently anywhere on the planet who isn't being defamed by agents, shills and idiots on the internet. So if you see people who are saying things that you feel resonate in your heart and you know there's truth in what they're saying, it doesn't matter if they're wrong about other things, nobody's right about everything. You'd only learn from your mistakes. So if anyone asks, you know, how come you're so knowledgeable, Mike? Well, I say because I've made enough mistakes to know. You see, I was hoodwinked by socialism. I thought, no, it is a good idea, we just need a benevolent government. And then I, I tried to find a benevolent government, and I couldn't find one. They don't exist. Because government originates from government. And government means the control of the mind. Government is mind control. It's for you to defer your critical thinking capabilities to people who not only don't give a shit about you and your family, they want to take you down and steal all your assets in the process. They want to cull the people who they call the herd down to a manageable number. Is it becoming obvious why? Georgia Guidestones. Well, the Georgia Guidestones, they, they, they stated 500 million is the number that they're aiming for. Five, just look it up, the Georgia Guidestones, if you haven't already. So, how do you think all of the courts, all of the civil courts that are currently running in the name of Her Majesty for the Crown House of Rothschild, how do you think they would cope with something I'm calling, because that's its name, a mortgage strike? My dad said to me on February the, I believe it was February the 19th, 2010, as we drove to the offices of a Bank of Scotland director to present the promissory note the first time we presented it and explain to them why they were discharging the debt under the Bills of Exchange Act if they refused it. After a three and a half hour meeting, and me and my dad were, were driving back, and he said to me, they're not going to accept it all of a sudden, even though they should. They're not, are they? I went, no, Dad, they're not. And he said, so, I just want you to know one thing. I'm in this till the end. Whatever the throw were, 
I'm not fucking backing down on this. And I said, great, great. Because that's all I needed. All I needed for him to say was, I'm very, very angry and I'm not going to take it anymore. And that's what he said. And he hasn't backed down and he never will, no matter what. And he said to me, after he walked out of the High Court in Leeds, when Barons reversed his own judgments in the proceedings to agree that the mortgage in question was void under the same arguments which had been dismissed as totally without merit, when he walked out, the first thing he said to me, the reason I was able to go into that court when they banned you from going in and being the advocate for the trustees, they thought I was finished. They thought I was finished. And I'm telling you, son, I would have been if you hadn't stood up and said, I don't care what anyone says, I've studied this. And even if everyone thinks I'm wrong, I know I'm not, because I've studied this. And I wouldn't even put forward the proposition if I was wrong or if there was any chance I was wrong. I've never been more right about anything in my life. The entire mortgage transaction from beginning to end, it's institutionalized fraud. They never lend you any money. There's never a valid and enforceable contract. There's never a valid and enforceable deed, at least until the last couple of years, because they started doing it right, to prevent losing in proceedings. There isn't a single credit card company that you cannot foil just by asking three simple questions. Provide me with a bilateral contract signed by both parties including all of the terms and conditions of the agreement. They'll say that we don't need one, we just need a unilateral agreement that you sign. And then ask them for a copy of whatever they deem to be a purported contract. Then ask them for the proof that they actually lent you the money. And then ask them for the CEO or the chief financial officer, officer to sign off on the debt. They never do it. They might still come after you, but generally they'll give it to a debt collection agency and that's good. You ask them the same questions, they can't provide them. You ask them to provide evidence that you have any kind of contact with them. If they've both been stupid enough to buy the debt in a pool of debts, <coughs> they've already paid it off for you. It's a gift. But most people, they, they, they see the threats, and they think, oh, I've got to comply. They're going to come round with the heavies. I, I've got kids. I don't want any of that bother to deal with, which is understandable. But when's it going to stop? It's going to stop when there are people in every community who are tooled up with the knowledge, who can go to anybody who puts a, 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 an appeal on social media. You can go on social media, and you can on Facebook or on Twitter. You can just do a search. There are sites in abundance that will tell you how to enter into these very simple, straightforward processes and demonstrate that they don't have a valid claim against you. And I'll just explain exactly what I mean. Three, it, I, I basically dealt about six years ago now, almost six years, I dealt with three credit card companies on behalf of my wife. And they were all fraudulent claims. We asked them all these questions. They refused to accept that they didn't have a valid claim. They made all the threats. And I was representing her interest in this. And basically, we served commercial liens against each of the CEOs for millions of pounds in a counterclaim for the fraud that they perpetrated against my wife and were continuing to try and enforce. They gave them, each, each credit card company gave them to every debt collection agent in the, country, in the country, and I mean it, and every single one of them, like a domino, fell, one after the other. Same method, repeating over and over. Now, when it got to the point where American Express appointed a, a, a law firm called Mishkondorea, which was Princess Diana's law firm, believe it or not, uh, or they, they represented her. Now, when they got a senior lawyer there to start coming after us, more, more, more to the point, coming after me because of these arguments that I was putting forward at a time when they weren't used to hearing them, when they started doing that, I entered into a, a series of correspondence. There were 14 items, seven each. And the first one was, nothing you are saying has any merit at all. You're taking this useless information which you found on American websites and trying to apply it in English law, and it simply doesn't apply. There is a valid debt. It is enforceable. Now, please just accept the fact. And, of course, I rebutted every point, point for point. And then I gave them all the case law that I had in support of the arguments we were putting forward. There was a, a, a case called um, Wilson v. Uh, v. Some Form of Trust, which... First County Trust, Wilson Lee, First County Trust, something like that, in the House of Lords, which proved that they didn't have any enforceable agreement. Now, here's the thing. When we got to the seventh piece of correspondence, they wrote to me and, and said, we do not see any merit in continuing this legal discussion. Please do not write to us ever again. 
place. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, did they come after us after that? No. They sent numerous debt collection agents, and in the end, every one of them fell away for the, for the same reason. Then, Capital One, similar things that happened. Capital One, five and a half years after issuing the claim, after it was from the time it was disputed, the debt rather was disputed. Five and a half years later, they employ Lowell Financial to come and collect the debt. Lowell end up buying it in a pool of debts. We ask them, where's the proof of an enforceable contract? Where's the proof that you lent any money? Where's the proof that my wife opened an account with you that you claim to have? Where's the proof that the credit card company and you have not committed fraud, both criminal and civil? Where's the proof that you're not in breach of all of the OFT rules, etc., etc.? And they wrote back saying that it had been passed to their fraud department. So I said to them, if you write to this address again, you're going to be charged £1,500 from the beginning for each time because you don't have authorization to write here or even to use my wife's name. And they said, right, we've come to a conclusion. That conclusion is all of your arguments are wrong. They're completely wrong, and they didn't give any reasons why. They just blathered on for a couple of paragraphs saying they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong. We don't accept that they're right. We don't accept that they're right. Words to that effect again and again. And then said, however, at the end, as a gesture of goodwill, we are closing your account, and we won't be giving it back to the credit card company, and we won't be coming after us again. What I'm emphasizing here, when you win, they never admit liability by admitting that you've won. But who in their right mind is going to let a legitimate debt of five grand go? A corporation. They're just not going to do it. Just like in Tom Crawford's case, when the judge admitted that the bank couldn't prove the validity of the amount claimed to be due and outstanding, he had to dress the judgment up so it looked as if the bank had still won because otherwise he's admitting that the bank has committed fraud as a matter of standard practice, just like the rest of the mortgage industry. Who pays the judge's wages or salaries? The banks. The banks through the Crown House of Rothschild, yeah. Who owns the bank in question, Bradford and Bingley? The government. <laughs> Same thing. So is that not a conflict of interest? Of course it is. But this is the system we're up against. This is how we know it's rigged. When my dad got that summary judgment, that every mortgage or can rely upon the defects in the mortgage deeds or documents, that changed the law. Every mortgage or can rely on that. When Tom proved beyond doubt in that court, even though it was the county court, so it's not binding, when he proved beyond doubt that he did have an endowment mortgage and they couldn't prove that the amount that they were claiming was due and outstanding, that is fraud and it was pleaded very distinctly in the case. I should know because I was heavily involved. Now, the fact that the evidence that has been accepted in every single county court possession proceeding as enough evidence to validate a debt has now been deemed by a QC to be ludicrous. Because in his words, computers are the slaves, not the masters of people. Because people put the information in. So how can you say that computer-generated printouts are valid? You can't unless you lie. Or unless you're stupid. Now, given those two things, have the repossession stopped? Are all the other judges applying these principles in other cases? No. But in Northern Ireland and in Southern Ireland, in a case called Ray, and in a case called McGreedy, they have had results in the High Court which have changed the landscape. For all of us, really. Because they have proven beyond doubt that the banks are lying as a matter of corporate policy in every single possession claim. Because not only can they never prove whatever amount they claim to be due and outstanding, they're securitizing mortgages without disclosing that fact, and they're getting way above the amount claimed from the mortgage or in payment from whoever they sell it to and they're selling it in pools pools of other mortgages now I'm going to explain very very simply what that means there's just a little drop of water in there you can see it now if I poured a bottle of water into there could I ever retrieve that water it becomes part of something else, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same with a mortgage or a credit card when it's securitized. And this argument has been won in the county court. A, a judge was happy to accept that 
If you've securitized an alleged debt, it can never be retrieved from the pool. And he used the analogy of the jug of water. It's not that we're not making a difference because I keep getting told by people who claim to be behind the scenes, keep going, you're really making a difference. You're really, really rattling them because you're not letting go. And other people are standing up and making the same arguments and they're not letting them go. And they're not letting them go and others are not going to let them go when they find out for one reason. All we're doing from the very beginning is standing on the truth. And saying, apply the law like you say in your courts it should be applied instead of applying it selectively. But in a tyrannous state, they never, ever apply the law in favour of the subject. In essence, what I want you all, if possible, to take away from this is a little bit of hope. And that hope is, if you study history, if you really look as far back as you can, you will see that the moments of the greatest ingenuity from mankind were when its collective back was placed right against the wall. If you do not know that there are at least 10 counts of genocide going on in this country now, then you're walking around either with your head in the clouds or your head stuck up your arse and pretending it's not there. You have to start looking. You have to encourage everybody you know to look, and I know a lot of you are already doing it, but I'm saying this because you can't convince anybody of what the truth is. You have to let them find it themselves. So if we tell all our kids what we weren't told, and if we say, look, I had this wrong <coughs> for the longest time. I believed that certain things were true, that the government would never plot to kill me or anybody else, that they would do the right thing in the courts. I believed that bank, bank managers were trustworthy people and that you know, they weren't trying to rip me off and they weren't really lending me the money. And I was wrong. When I looked for myself, I found out I was wrong. And I learned from my mistakes. Because my dad, my dad actually said, and I never thought I'd ever hear him say it, he actually said, we didn't have the access to the information you know, Michael. We didn't. That's why we believed these things. And I said, you're right, Dad. And they've relied on that. But what they've unleashed with the internet, which is the location of effectively all of the greatest libraries that have ever existed in one. I know you have to search through and wade through the bullshit and 85% of what you might find on certain subjects will be bullshit, but the truth really is out there. It is. But the first place you've got to look is within. Until you know in your heart that you can't take part in the slaughter of other people's children in any way, this won't end. Until you decide that if the council is allowing all of the policies relating to Agenda 21 to be implemented, then not only is that council not fit for purpose, every one of those councillors is guilty of misconduct in public office and their ancillaries to genocide, which is exactly what applies to everybody who pays for the ongoing slaughter of the innocent in foreign crimes. And on, here, on these islands. So, the question is, how much is going to be too much? Because I've had way too much a long time ago. All my life has been filled with clashes with authority. But there's only one thing that I've ever asked of so-called authority figures. You tell me, you give me the justification of why I should do what you tell me to do. And not one, not one has ever been able to say anything except because I told you so. That's why you should do it. Now, just because the government tells you that things are true, it clearly doesn't mean they're true, does it? No. Well, what if everything the government said wasn't true? Would that be easier to understand? Would it be easier to understand if you knew that every time you go to a doctor's, they're more than, more than likely, if not always, going to prescribe some pharmaceutical drug which is going to make you ill, so you have to get some other pharmaceutical drug to make those symptoms better, and on and on and on. How many people are aware that when you go into hospital over a certain age, you're likely not to come out? Exactly. Exactly. And it's not because... You know, there's an accident, they give you too much of this, not enough of that, or there isn't enough care. It's not because of those things. It's because there is a policy to implement and dose people with toxic chemicals which are going to kill them. Kill them. 
This is because they deem everybody over a certain age expendable. Not really providing anything for their, that supplement their interests. So, what about the food? Everything you eat that isn't organic, that you buy in the shops that is packaged, is full of shit that's going to make you ill. Every time you drink water out the tap, without distilling it, or ozonating it, or cleaning it through reverse osmosis, every single time you're taking stuff into your body that's going to make you ill. Every single time you take a chemical into your body, it's doing you damage that's going to make you ill. So what have the European commissars done? They've made all of the beneficial herbs and plants and potions and pills illegal. Illegal. They've made it illegal to say you can cure cancer with so many different things with an act of parliament called the Cancer Act. Illegal to say there's a cure for cancer. Why? Well, they wouldn't make such endless amounts of money through the cancer industry. They wouldn't be able to kill so many people by destroying all their cells through radiation treatment. When they can take a simple vial of cannabis oil, if it's the right cannabis oil, bicarb generally, if you take it, a spoonful in a glass every day, you very rarely get ill. Stop cleaning your teeth with, 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 with any paste which has got chemicals in it. Swill your mouth for anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes a day with organic coconut oil. And not only will you never ever have sore gums again or any infection, your teeth, which have been butchered by dentists, if, if you're in the same boat as me, will start remineralizing and grow back. But we're talking about so many different things they've told us that are healthy for us, and they're not, they're killing us. Slowly, but does it because a murder or a series of genocides is taking place in slow motion? Does that mean it's not happening? Because I honestly feel like I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of an enormous car crash that is all happening in slow motion, and there's millions of vehicles involved, and they're all heading towards the same place. It's head on collision, everybody all at the same time, everything's going to implode if it continues. And yet, some people are in the cars are pulled up and parked. And the people behind them, they're bumping in and say, why don't you let me pass? I don't go any further than this. Certain death is that way. This way, self-determination, independence, sovereignty of the people, an end to centralised government, an end to all the lies and deception, because who in this room does not have this experience? Generally in life, wherever you are, whatever people you're surrounded with, in a moment of emergency, let's say when a kid steps out into the road or something like that, the reaction of people is to, to get them. It's to do the right thing. Or, you know, if, if you see someone in the street who's clearly starving and on the verge of death, most people, not most people in London where I lived for 12 years, but that's a different story, most people in most places, their heart goes out of them. They think, well, that could be me, couldn't it? There are so many videos of young people, you know, they say that they're, they're, they're buying them food. As they know, well, you know, if I was as desperate as you, I'd be tempted to buy to, to, to pay for drugs, which might kill me anyway. You know, so they're giving them food. People are waking up to the fact that the heart, the heart of the problem is understanding that the people who are running your lives and think that you are lower than the shit on the bottom of their shoe and they can wipe you out in an instant if they so choose. They care nothing for you. They never will. They never have. And they don't want your children to have a life that doesn't involve enslavement and fraudulent death. And death for the majority. And death for all who do not comply with the tyranny. That's the choice. That really is the choice. But it is a choice. It is. We've only got until they stop, if they get that far, until they start locking people up for speaking out. Cameron, as you know, is attempting to criminalise free speech. Hillary Clinton is running on, on getting rid of free speech. That's, that's to blame for everything, just like the people having the guns in America. But I'm telling you, since they tried to outlaw guns in America, the sale of guns has increased dramatically. There are over 200 million unaccounted for weapons that have been purchased in America alone, and they're not being purchased by the government. They're being purchased by people who are waking up. They are going to protect yourself. We don't have that protection here. Because you say, I don't need a gun. <coughs> I don't have a gun. I'm not trying to get a gun. But if I did have a gun, I would have something that was a last resort to protect my family with. That means that we have to do it with our backs against the wall, using our ingenuity, our courage, and our guile. However, 
we can do it. There's no doubt we can do it. Our, our ancestors have done it. It's in our genes. It's in our DNA. We are the people who can put an end to this tyranny. We are. All of us, individually, by leading by example, every one of us, by not saying, well, you know, I've got all these things which I have to keep paying, to just say, no, I'm not going to comply anymore. There's more of us than them. So, say again. There's more of us than them. There's more of us than them, and there always will be, unless they get their way and wipe us out. It's the reason they want to wipe <coughs> us out, because it just takes the realization of a certain number, I don't know how many, but it's a small percentage of any community to wake up and take action. Take action. To show people that somehow, when you stand up and have the courage to say, I'm not going to take this anymore, the game changes. It changes. And if you tell everyone you know that there is something they can do, and they've just got to do that, their bit, whatever that is, then that will carry on spreading exponentially. And just know that if you have anybody trying to steal your property from you, posing as the government or agents of the government or agents of the banks or bailiffs who are just licensed pirates, when anyone does that now, unlike 2009, 2010, 2011, unlike then, there is somebody who will put the word out on Facebook or other social media who will get together a response team, and they're called Response UK, and there's other groups like them. Don't rule any of them out, because we've all got to unite on the things that we hold in common, on, our, on all, all of the, 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 the mutual issues that we can so easily agree on. That's why I, want to, I don't want to focus on any of the things that we can argue about all night, just the things that we can agree on. Ask any midwife, Now I'm not saying any midwife will say the same thing, but ask any midwife of the last, who's been a midwife for the last five years, if they've heard of something called freeborns, because that is what the midwives in Middlesbrough told one of my friends who followed the same process and didn't register his son, that's what they, they were told by the midwives when they said they weren't registering. So, oh, another one of those freeborn. Freeborn. Does that suggest that the remedy doesn't have merit? Or does it suggest that you're actually making sure that they are freeborn? And only they can. can submit the servitude if that be their choice. When the Guardian and the Telegraph start posting things like, eventually the middle classes are going to get so angry because they're being squeezed so much and it's becoming apparent that they're coming after them as well, as well as the so-called working classes, the realisation that is taking place, because I get emails from people from all social classes, and they're saying, whatever it looks like, what is happening is making a significant difference a significant difference, and this is because who's got the biggest mortgages? <laughs> who has the biggest millstones around the neck? Middle the middle class. Yes. They're the ones who are the greatest slaves, and they weren't aware of it, and that's making them mad. And that's what they need to be. A mortgage strike, a mortgage strike, a mortgage strike. If there were a mortgage strike on the same grounds I put forward, there is no valid mortgage contract which complies with Section 2 of the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989. <coughs> there is no valid mortgage deed which complies with Section 1.3 of the 1989 Act. That's the same Act. There is no evidence whatsoever that this bank lent me any money or that they had the means to lend me money at the time of the reported loan. All of this amounts to a void mortgage. Nobody has to pay a void mortgage. But what I'm also saying is, without numbers, without a, a, at least 10,000 people agreeing to take part in the mortgage strike, we cannot bring the system to a standstill. I'm not telling anyone to go into fault. It's best not to go into fault, but you ask those questions and they can't provide the evidence that you've asked for. That's it, you can say, right, I'm setting aside all the payments in a different account and I'm actually gonna take action to put an end to this, once, one way or the other. If you've paid your mortgage, you can ask them the same questions to provide all the same evidence that there was a valid mortgage. And if they say, oh, we've destroyed them, well, well, that means you've got no evidence that there was a valid mortgage. If you wanted to become a part of the voluntarist, sovereign, independent organization, which has no leaders, but all it does is it offers protection under international law through the UCT treaty, all you have to do is declare, now, I'm going to live in accordance with the principles set down in the treaty, or even just certain aspects of it. And then you can stand under the terms of the treaty. I'm not saying they're going to accept it straight away, 
or even that you're not going to have problems. However, I have no problems, and there are others I know who have no problems because we become more trouble than it's worth to take on. Despite all the battles that I'm still involved in now and have been, I haven't got one single outstanding issue with the state, or rather they've got no outstanding issue with me. But it's me who has an outstanding issue with them, as does everybody else within UCT who signed the treaty, because it declares that our purpose is to end all forms of genocide against the indigenous peoples of the world. All forms. And the purpose of the treaty is so all indigenous peoples can stand under its terms because it is the only jurisdiction on the planet that exists under natural law. The only one. The doctrine of usufruct is one of the most fucked up legal concepts I've ever heard of. It's the law of occupation. It's the law of occupation. What it means is that if any party who has exercised a right to use your property or somebody else's property without the legal right to do so has the right to continue doing so in the absence of your objection to them doing that. In other words, they got the right to use your name, and it is your name, it doesn't belong to them. Just because it was capitalised on the birth of it still doesn't belong to them. It was given free and clear to you by your parents before any of that happened. It was a gift free and clear for you to use or not use. It was up to you. Just by capitalising a name does not transfer ownership. What it does, it registers the name of a future tax slave. That's what it does. Yeah. So, given that that which never had life cannot ever be considered legally dead, let's put that issue to one side and know that what this is really about is the number of lives that are created and the amount of money that is generated from each life and then the time it takes to wipe each life out in order to create more profit and more control. That's what this is about, the whole shit parade. And I wish this wasn't the case. We are witnessing the most aggressive form of corporatism, which is overt fascism, that has ever been known in the history of mankind. We are witnessing it, and some of us are even party to it, whether we know it or not. And that is the position that we're in. Now, how many of us have been involved in conversations or thought to themselves, what would I have done if I suddenly realised I was living in Berlin in 1936 yeah. and they started slaughtering people around me, people started disappearing, everyone who spoke out, what would I do? Would I comply and go along with it and then end up being an accessory to it? Or would I stand up and do something and risk my own life? Well, we're not at that point where anyone who speaks up is going to be put up against the wall but I wouldn't write it off as a possibility because they've already decreed that everybody who criticizes the government is a terrorist. They've already decreed it. Doesn't mean it's true, doesn't mean it can be enforced, because quite frankly, if the German police put down their weapons two years ago at a mass gen de de demonstration in Germany that they were, they were ordered to suppress, they put down their weapons and they marched with the people. If the German police can do that, any police force can do it. And I'm putting out an appeal in the near future in the form of a podcast, which will be to everybody serving in the armed forces under false oaths. Everyone serving in the so-called police force who are just nothing more than glorified collection agents for the Crown now. They've got no power of discretion to do anything that they haven't been ordered to do. We've got no protection anymore. So we have to protect ourselves. There's no other way. So just, just consider how you are going to feel if you do nothing. And I know some of you are already doing things, but I couldn't live with the thought that my daughter, when she's 25, with a millstone around her neck from going to university and learning shite that she never wanted to learn, to get a piece of paper to qualify for a job that she's been ordered to do by the state and she's got no choice and then saying dad I'm 25 I'm still living with my parents and my life is not my own you put out all that information about what was going on and then you stopped you didn't do anything anymore you stopped why did you stop I can't live with that because I knew enough to do whatever I can every day and damn the consequences fuck that 
I'd much rather my daughter, in the end, no matter what happens to me, looks back and says, you know what? My dad had a crack. He really had a crack of getting people to think for themselves. Not trying to tell them what to do, but to get them to think and act for themselves. And not comply with what he viewed as tyranny. It's time to stand up the bullies. All of them. No matter what costume they come dressed in. And to say, not here. I'm not going to put up with it anymore. So, on that note, thank you very much for bearing with me on a very sweaty, hot <laughs> afternoon. And it's been an absolute pleasure, and I hope that you've all taken something valuable from it. So, thank you very much.